Hey everybody, welcome once again. We are Artists on Lockdown, our weekly presentation where we feature some of the biggest names in music. Some of the guys in front of the mic, behind the mic, behind the drums of course. Tonight we'll be talking to two great individuals, bass players, which we haven't done in a while. And it will be sandwiched between my two good buddies, my brothers, to the biggest and best rock and roll drummers in history. Uh, first of all, I want to bring, again, it's going to be my my twin brother, I'm going to say, from uh, of Last in Line. We'll be talking about uh, Last in Line a lot tonight, but also Dio and uh, Black Sabbath. Vinny Apice. Come on on, Vin. Hello. Well, here I am. From the there day. you are, again, sir. Welcome back. Now, how old Locked are you? Locked in ben? my room. Locked in my room again. How old are you? What is your age? My age? I'm yeah. six, 16 Celsius. Okay, so then you're my like you're you're my middle brother because my older brother will be Carmine. And we're gonna bring him on right now. You know, again, legendary drummer with, of course, Vanilla Fudge, but also the Rod Stewart Band, Jeff Beck, and so many other things, touching so many lives. Say hello to Carmine Uppy. Say, Carm. Hey, dude. How you doing, man? Hey, Ben. So good hey, to you. Hey, what's with the pink shirt in Florida? Hey, it's Florida, dude. Okay. I, I could put my collar up and make it look cooler. You huh? used to wear all black. Uh, yeah, you know what? I had to, I had to look. Uh, I thought it was Don Johnson from Miami Vice. <laughs> it is Don Johnson. You know, we have the same birthday. Really? Really? Yeah. See? I felt it. See? I felt it. December, December 15th is his birthday and my birthday. Wow. Well, we got, we got another, big, another big show planned this week. Um, you know, one of, you know, with all the great things that Vinny has done, obviously with uh, – with Ozzy and with uh, with Dio, great bands. I had the privilege in, of, of working with him personally with his band Last in Line. And tonight we have his bandmate, uh, one of the uh, again one of the greatest and most accomplished bass players in rock and roll. Let's bring to our stage artist on lockdown presents Phil Susan. Phil, where you at, buddy? Uh oh, oh there we go. There we lost there. Phil, but let's bring in Kenny. We lost hey, Phil. We lost Phil. What do you mean you lost Phil? Okay, so we'll bring Phil back because we have another bass player, which we're so excited <laughs> to have tonight. <laughs> this, is, this is the great thing about live TV. Uh, yeah, exactly. But again, if you say Dylan, if you say Derringer, Billy Idol, Joan Jett, Hall & Oates, so many <laughs> great bands, this guy's been part of them all. We'd like to welcome to Artists on Lockdown, bass player extraordinaire, Mr. Kenny Aronson. Hey, oh, hey, 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 technology here, man. This is great. Yeah. How you guys doing? Good. How you doing, Ken? Good, man. Good. I can go get my, look, I got the Florida shirt on. I, I know. I got the Florida hat like Kenny's. There you, there you go, you know? man. You look like a Hello. flamingo. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm, still wearing, I'm still wearing black, though. Oh, uh, you're wearing black. I can go get a black shirt too if you want. Well, it's into pink now. Yeah. Hey, I want to know what, what shirt you're wearing, Ron. You know what? Here's the thing. I I feel uh -oh. terrible because you know I normally do a really good job with the shirts, as you know. But yes. uh, I had a last minute thing. I had to run out, and the only one I had in my car. Rush. Oh, <laughs> rush. Yeah, rush. We Which have, doesn't. We we, we gave you a last in line shirt. We gave you a last I know. Line. I got last in line, vanilla fudge. No. I got yes, oh, yes, Phil. Yes, Phil. Hey. Uh, Chrome crashed my my Mac my MacBook. It's uh that's that book that laptop never crashes, but this crashed it. So I don't know what happened. All of a sudden everybody froze. I was about to make the joke of the century. Now I can't remember <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, now you're probably, yeah, Phil, do you know Kenny? Uh, I have met Kenny several times. I think the last time we met was at the uh, was at the Rainbow. You you remember that remember that place, the uh, place of pizzas and moving stars. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How are you, Kenny? It's good back, to see you. Man. It's yeah. good to see you. Well back. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Kenny's. So you oh, know, thank it's you, always, this is a real a real pleasure. So uh, it's always great to see you again. Oh, well, nice to see you. Thank you. We're alive well, to Kenny's talk about it. Our, uh, Kenny is part of our uh, our growing 
Brooklyn All Star team we've been putting together. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, uh, I would love to see you yeah. guys in some schoolyards with a, with a couple baseball bats and and your bases. You know, football, football. <laughs> you need you're gonna ball, need them. I'm I'm from Chicago. I'm talking about softball here. Anyway, so good to see you guys. Welcome to Artists on Lockdown. So many questions. So many fans have been chiming in all week. They know that both you guys. Uh, are on our show tonight. So thanks for joining us. I know you guys are, I mean, are you guys, uh, I'm sure you're doing some new music. I'm sure you're doing some, are you doing, can, uh, Phil, are you doing any of your master classes while you're on lockdown? No, not really. Uh, I did a couple. <laughs> <laughs> no. The, nope. the reason, the reason it's being. Like, that that's I, like not be playing. Yes, yes, yes. No. No. <laughs> no. I'm, the reason is that I'm, I'm about to start doing some work with another company. And so I've sort of been holding back to do some of those. But uh, I'd like to get more of a sort of organized format of doing that. I think it's a, it's great. I learn more doing those than, than pr probably people watching learn. Uh, as I'm sure you, all of us here know, the minute you start teaching somebody something, it gives you a, a forces you to have a better understanding of what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I really look forward to those things. But uh, I was doing some cooking. You know, stuff like that, stuff that had nothing to do with music. All right, I got to know, it's important to me personally, being an Italian-American, what is your specialty at the stove? Uh, I, ask Vinny. <laughs> oh, really? Man, he, he came over my house one time. He, like, him and his wife, uh, Jen, slept over. And he goes, I'll make breakfast. And I'm like, well, there's nothing really in the fridge. Just some eggs and all this shit. <laughs> And he made like this gourmet <laughs> with the garnish on the side, eggs and bacon, and it was amazing. He's an amazing chef. It's, oh, it's thank you. Pizza. Well, all right, Phil. So when when you come by us at the Arcada Theater, you are. Would you cook something for us? No, you're supposed to cook for me. I know. <laughs> you the meatballs. Come on. Meatballs. Well, yeah, here's a great chef. I specialize in probably a, sort of a, a lot of Mediterranean stuff, like French and fusion with Asian, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's my favorite stuff to cook. Really, fusion's so. big. Hey, Kenny, yeah. it's so good to see you, man. Thanks for, for joining us. You know, uh, one of my favorite songs, and this is probably a, a, a hair off, out of left field, but Brother Louie, one of my favorite, favorite songs. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it, you know. Um, what can you tell me about anything about that? I mean, it was it was it was a social thing going on. You hear what's going on these days. You don't I mean, know what you just stepped into just now. <laughs> well, uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, I'm about I'm about I'm I'm just about dealing with trying to recoup royalties that I've never seen. Oh, really? Man. And, and there's a dispute going on as to whether I was actually in the band or not. Oh. And, and I just was cut and I just got contact. I just, I, I contacted the AF of M and they actually got back to me today. And one day this happened and they're telling me I have to prove to them that I played on the record because I actually never got credited on the album. Wow. Because, wow. because of the strange circumstances of how, that particular record, I'll just tell you real quickly Jesus. that the album that Brother Louie was, is on, which is the Second Stories album, mm -hmm. came out at a time when the band was in flux and I hadn't been in the band yet. So the band got reshuffled around. I joined the band. Then I did that track with everybody and we just did it as session musicians for another <sighs> band actually. And then Neil Bogard of Kamasutra Records gave it gave it the stories as their next single. So they they re-released the album, and everybody, the producers of the record, got credit on it, and they left my name off. Oh, oh man! man. Oh, oh. Oh, so my God. I got really screwed on that one, and now I'm now I have to go prove that I played on the damn record. Why don't you Why don't you, why don't you do play play the song for them? But I mean, it's just absurd, you know, yeah, that, yeah. that I got to go through hoops to do this. So I'm actually going to be, I'm going to put it out right here. Everybody that knows me, that knows that I play on yeah. that record. That's right. You should call a union and tell those fuckers that I did it. Excuse me. But uh, anyway, that's what's happening with me today. 
that's the latest thing. Wow, today, and, where and, did you and hopefully, it? hopefully it'll get worked out. Wow, was it at a studio, like a public studio, uh, at the time? What, where did you record it? We recorded it at Bell Sound in New York City. That was big, a, a really big, famous studio. A big, yeah, big place. Bell Sound. So did uh, they have? Did they have like a, do they have like a log or something like when people checked in that day or something from the studio well, kind of a thing? They, they should, and the union asked me if if I can prove it by by showing them union contracts. Ooh. I know that oh union. My God, yeah. and, you, and this is 1973. <laughs> Everybody that was involved is pretty much dead at this point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Neil Bogart oh is dead. One of the two producers is dead. Although I got a letter from the other producer stating that you know I'm on the record, but I'm telling you, it's just it's unbelievable. Wow. I'm, de I'm dealing with this now. I'm 68 years old. I did this track when I was 21. <laughs> <laughs> well, who, well, what I wanted to um, Kenny, who, uh, Kenny, who, 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 it up. who do they imagine was actually playing on it then? Does anyone else has anyone else contested it? Oh no, absolutely not. So what's the problem? I don't. Well. Yes, the union. They're just yeah. being really because what because I'm not credited on the record. Is, is that for so, a, is that for a sound a sound exchange kind of royalty? Well, it, it came up through sound exchange. Yeah, which I thought it came up through sound because, because the union the union pays royalties for artists that play play with like I get my Rod Stewart and uh, Pink Floyd and all the stuff that I did instead of getting it directly from sound exchange, I get it from union which is well then you know what we'll we'll stop the conversation now because i don't want to get into it because it's in, going to be yeah. in public but i'm going to talk to you about that carmine because okay. I, yeah. I can use uh, a little you know i'm not the type of guy that's going to try to get something that doesn't belong to me but i do want to find out whatever monies are there for me where are they what happened to it and yeah. and you know just straighten it all out if right. it's, if it can be at this point but yeah. Anyway, other than that, life is great. I'm down here in my basement, and uh, what I do in my spare time is I've been playing a lot of this. All oh, right. Oh. oh, wow. What is wow. it? <laughs> that, that's a early nice. '60s Fender double neck steel guitar. It's a deluxe oh, six. Nice. Jeez. Yeah. So I've been uh, doing a lot of recording down here in my basement. Let's see. That, that looks like something yeah. that, uh, like a, as Phil would, it looks like something Edgar Winter would uh, uh, perform there's, on. There's Fat Elvis <laughs> in the background there. We got uh. Fat Elvis. And uh, hey, there's my there's my brother Louis Gold Records. There you yeah, go. Right. Anyway, so that's what I've been doing. Why, why, you should use that as your evidence. How did you get a gold oh, record if you were part of it? What's that? If well, you, like, if you like got a gold, gold record, you got yeah. a gold record. Yeah. There, yeah. That's, that's your Absolutely. proof. But anyway, so, like, so uh, if you didn't do it, who did? Well, you know, I mean, I, geez, my basically well, my reputation got staked on it staked on that record initially. You know, here, well, here's some, my career. Here's some news for you. Next <laughs> week, I get my internet connection in my guest house where I have the studio I put together, and Vinny built me the computer. And I can't really do much in there without the internet connection. So, Vin, Monday I get the internet connection. Yeah. And then, and then I can do this from there too, and I can show you the studio. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, uh, Kenny, not to not to belabor the issue because I, I apologize for the you know the sensitive nature of it, but I did just because of the way things are going these days. You know, the the social issues surrounding that song. Uh, are there any likenesses from back then to that that make sense right now? What's going on? I don't think a whole lot has changed, really. Actually, <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't really. Uh, I don't know. I never really gave it much thought, really. But uh, I don't know. I kind of think it still relates to some degree today. Maybe not as much. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, things are. Things are more open, certainly, than they were back then. You know, it's funny. Um, it's only back in 1973 then, that we did that tune, but things were pretty. You know, I remember I started traveling back back then and started heading down south and with with with, uh, with stories. That's when I started really traveling. 
And uh, I saw a lot of crazy, crazy stuff going on, you know, just uh, socially with with racial stuff back then. It was mm -hmm. disturbing. It was very disturbing. Yeah, you, you know, as it is today. Yep. Yeah. So let me ask you guys, uh, Phil, Kenny, I mean, you know, there's a little overlap with uh, a gentleman, gentleman by the name of Billy Idol. Um, kind of uh, a strange <laughs> I know. You know funny. I say the, I say the name every question. So if you guys, can you give us a little something that, uh, you know, happened backstage with Billy? I mean, Well, so well be, even before that, <laughs> when did Phil play with Billy and when did Kenny play with Billy? <laughs> you both play with Billy. Year-wise, because yeah. that's, that would, I think that's interesting. Go ahead, yep. go ahead Phil. I played, uh, I did Charmed Life, so that would be 1988. Oh, and, uh, so I was much, right much before later. it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so I, I did Whiplash Smile. Yeah. I, I went to see you. I, I saw you guys. And, and what year was that, Kenny? 87. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. Isn't that wild? One after, so you were the next bass player, Phil, after after Kenny. Yeah, it was. Um, That's pretty funny. You think about it. It was, it was more, uh, it was more, um, it was more of a, 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 a total situation for Billy than, than that. We, we ended up taking a vacation together in 1980s, 80s, well, it was at the end of 87 and uh, we were in Tahiti and he would told me he'd kind of got fed up with not 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 with this band, but with the whole situation being on the East Coast and everything. And he was looking to maybe relocate somewhere else, maybe to the West Coast. And we spent a lot of time together um, over the next few weeks. And one and then one day he moved out there and he said to me, I want to put a whole new band together. I want to try something completely different. And initially he wanted Randy Castillo and myself to, as his rhythm section. And he was going to find a new guitar player. And uh, with the exception of Randy, all of that came to be. Um, uh, Randy didn't, uh, I guess his producer, Keith Forsey, came back. And Keith just didn't, I don't know, just didn't like Randy's playing or something. So before Randy had a chance to leave Ozzy uh, and jump ship, he decided to stay, stay with Ozzy. And so I went. So that's how that came about. So it wasn't really like one person was replacing somebody else. It was like a whole new new band for him. He wanted to try something different. Who played drums when Kenny played with him? And who Tommy played Price. drums? Tommy Price. Tommy Price. And what about you, Phil? Uh, well, we went through a long, long process to try to find a drummer. We went through some 20 or 30 drummers, and we ended up with Mike oh. Baird. Mike Baird oh. played on the, on the wow. Mm. Mike's, wow. Yeah, Mike is great. He's like a human drum machine. Yeah, yeah. And, and a very straight ahead drummer. We had some fantastic drummers come to play with us. Sugarfoot Moffat, Prairie yeah. Prince, a lot of fantastic drummers. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what Keith wanted was uh, Roger Lynn, you know, somebody that's just really just dead straight. And uh, yeah. Hey, Vinny, I didn't get a call for that. Did you? No, that's because we do too many fills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But okay. I mean, and I, and well, we did that Phil, not that yeah. Phil. Yeah. yeah. But my, my, me and me and Vinny did play with Kenny in two different yeah. situations. Yeah. I, I played with him with Leslie West, and Vinny played with him with Rick Derringer. And Phil played with us at the uh, one of our shows, a couple of our shows. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, he played with our shows. Yeah. Hey, can you see this? Look at this, Kenny. A Derringer picture. Wow. Oh my God. Oh wow! Look at the hair on that guy, Kenny. Yeah, <laughs> look, look, look! All the hair is gone. <laughs> look at that pitch. That's nice. That's, wow. look at ex so that's an explosion in a hair factory. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that, Vinny. I got, yeah, I got it. That's the photo session we did at Steve Paul's uh, place up in wow. Connecticut. I'd love to get a copy of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's big. It's a big. Oh wow! That. I've never seen that picture. Yeah, those I remember. Wow! wow. What happened? Oh no, man! <laughs> yeah, what <laughs> happened? Like, like all, all of a sudden, now we're all a bit older now. Old you know? now. Yeah. I just I just had Rick I just had Rick over the house here on Sunday to do uh, his own little podcast. He's going to be on this show, I think, in a couple of weeks. Are you yeah. guys in the same neighborhood, sort of? Well, he's uh, two and a half hours away in Florida. Oh, okay. But wow. he came down here with his wife to do some sort of real estate closing. And he asked me if I would do, uh, you know, this TV show. They videoed it. So we, we did it in our dining room there. It was the first time we had people over here. We only been down here a couple of, 
couple of months and we don't have all the furniture in yet. And, uh, but it was interesting because, uh, you know, we talked about the old days and talked about when you guys played together at, at Darren Japan. How he loved that band, you know. That was killer band. That it was, was a killer band. band. You know, the, the, the sad thing about that band was we just couldn't ever make the right record that yeah. get us radio play. Right. That was the one thing we just, it always yeah. eluded us. Every record, we tried a different producer, and that producer would try to put their stamp on us, and and we would try to be made this or that and this and that. And then we just go out live, and what we were, were just this powerhouse, raw, rocking band, but we just couldn't find the right songs that yeah. you know, and, and put and put it in such a format that would get radio play, you know, like everything that was going on at the time, Foreigner or Boston or Benatar or you know, yeah. people yeah. that were selling records, you know. And it's funny because Rick had hit records before that and had hit records as a producer. Yeah. So that makes it really even crazier. You know? Yeah. Crazy stuff. No. But hey, and, then I, and then I, and I played. And hold on. And then I played with Kenny with with Leslie West, oh, who, man. who had who had Mick Jones as his second guitar player. Yeah, wow. Mick Jones. Wow. You know, and that That's was a hell of a band. That was a great band too. But we never recorded. We just toured. Our my first uh, what was it? The first few gigs we did was was the first big tour that Kiss ever did. Remember? Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, and we, and we played with them, and uh, I was watching all the theatrics, you know, and uh, I remember, yeah. I remember in my solo, yeah, I don't know who that is. Who's on drums? It's the same hat. Oh, that's me. The same hat. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's me. It's the same hat. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what drum set that is. What drum set is that? Oh my yeah. god. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. I remember. You got a in your check, face. Yeah, yeah, check this out. So never so, mind. Never mind the drum kit. We want to hear about the hat. Yeah, yeah, so had, had, wait, 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 wait. So lighter now. Yeah, so so what we did was I saw all this Peter Chris stuff and all this kiss stuff, explosions and bomb. I don't know if you remember this, Kenny. I put lighter fluid on my symbols. <laughs> I, I said, Oh great, at the end of it, I'm just gonna light the symbols on fire. Oh man, I, did, I remember that now. And and then I hit the symbols and the crap flew off the stage into the front of the stage and started setting the whole place on fire. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah. That's not really the way pyro works, there, Carm. I know. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll tell Hilarious. you. Funny, I'll tell you a funny, quick story. Before you joined the band, when when uh, uh, Corky, Corky, sorry, Corky was playing, and that was like my third or fourth professional gig, and I, you know, Leslie. Leslie used to yell at me because I'd play too many notes and he'd say, uh, Ken, we don't need another Jack Bruce in the band, you know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, um, oh, jeez. I remember, <laughs> oh, so I used, wait, to, wait, wait. I used to actually practice back then and I would take music with me and Leslie would see me in my room, like practicing the sheet music. And he'd make fun and go, hey, look, the kid's practicing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that, was like, that was a trip. I mean, that was like my first experience with somebody really hardcore, serious rock rock and roll. And you, you know, always, at a level that I just wasn't used to yet. Yeah, and you always did a good impersonation of Leslie talking. <laughs> <Okay, no. laughs> he was great, though, man. Leslie was so funny. Jesus, yeah. It was nonstop. Yeah. God, and he played great. Yeah, yeah, he did. Played great. He used to yell at you hey, for you playing your hi hat fills. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, you got to play some hi hat fills. You know, yeah. he, still, he, he still owes me seven hundred fifty dollars for shipping my drums back. <laughs> <laughs> let it go, man. Let it go, man. Let it go oh, card. Yeah, I did. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. We've been, we've been uh, friends. I, you know, Leslie is the first guy that made it that I've known in the business. I know him since 1963. Wow. Right? When he was in the vagrants and they were un unknown by then. 
And uh, we, I was in a, an R&B band with horns and everything with pinstripe suits and teased up hair. And, wow. and, and we would play, you know, 40, 20 minutes, you know, half hour. And then another band would play. The other band was the Vagrants. And that's when Roger, the drummer, broke my bass drum pedal. And they came in, they looked like the Rolling Stones. And, you know, we're all decked out in suits and ties and stuff. And I said, who the hell are these guys? And I, boy, do they suck, you know? <laughs> And then they became the big rage of New York City like three years later. But I met him back then. And to this day, he's the oldest guy in the business that I've known that's still, you know, like famous and not dead. And not dead. Yeah, yeah not dead. Speaking of right. those guys, of those guys, Phil, I got to ask you, can you, you know, can you tell me a little bit about your experience with one of the greatest legends, obviously, Jimmy Page? Yeah. Yeah. Um we uh i was uh, in a band that was signed to his label we were, we were managed by peter grant actually it was simon kirk's band uh after bad company and what band? which band a band called wildlife oh okay i remember that yeah and uh so we were managed by peter and we were signed to swan song and i was a huge zeppelin fan and we were recording at uh, at jimmy's studio and uh he was uh he was a uh, how can i say he was in the kind of like a uh uh, he, he was just a, after John Bonham had passed away, he just became a recluse. You know, he wasn't out at all. He didn't go anywhere. And he kept threatening to come down to the studio to say hi. And I would wait every night. The other guys would go to the pub. And uh, after a few days of doing this, I got fed up and I went to the pub. And then Jimmy, uh, Peter called the next day and said, yeah, Jimmy came down to the studio last night to meet the, the guys. And no one was there, you know. <laughs> oh. Oh, Cut forward to several months later when the band basically dissolved, um, I uh, got a phone call from Phil Carlo, who, you know Phil Carlo, of course, Carmine. He was uh, yes. he is uh, Zeppelin's tour manager after Richard Cole, and he's still a very good friend of mine. And he called me and he said, would you like to put a, Jimmy wants to know if you would like to put a band together with him. And I thought, geez, are you kidding? I'm like 22 or something. Uh, hang on, I'll get back to you. No, that's not what I said. I said, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we got together, and we spent uh, we spent uh, several months, maybe close to ten months, in Nomis Studios in in London, just jamming and going over songs, and him rediscovering what he loved, uh, what he loved about his his music, and for me, discovering, also discovering what Jimmy loved about music, and it was a real eye opener. It was a it was the greatest experience of my life, um, and I have a huge background in uh, in a fifties American. Americana rock and roll, which I really was was big on, and so he naturally was also uh, uh, had an affinity for that. So we connected on 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 that level, and uh, I know Kenny, you play you play a lot of stuff like that as well, right? And uh, you, you played with Robert Gordon, didn't you? I think. Hey, are you guys having trouble with the audio? Who? Oh. Can you no. help? I've, I've, unfortunately, I, I have missed half of what you said. Oh. Yeah. Oh, well, it's it, like. <laughs> I'll start again. Anyway, Kenny, you got, you got uh, earphones yeah. in? Kenny, you got earphones in? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, everything was fine until Phil started talking. <laughs> that's, that's usually the case, Kenny. Hey, Phil, what was the band with Jimmy called? Well, actually, we, we had an, an unofficial name, which was called the McGregors. And did uh, it come out? Did the album come out? No, no, no. We it was it was going to become the firm, and I would have oh. stayed, I would have stayed in the band uh, were it not for the fact that uh, Ozzy asked me to, to go and play with him, and I had a dilemma. I could wow. go play with Ozzy, or go, or stick stick with Jimmy, and I talked to Jimmy about it. I said, "What do you think I should do?" And he said to me, "Well, I'm not planning on doing anything for quite some time, so if you want to go out there." You go with Ozzy. If you want to stick around for another year, year and a half or something until we're ready, I'd love to have you here. And uh, so I decided to go with Ozzy and we stayed, Jimmy and I stayed friends and he's, he's just one of the greatest people in the world. Uh, that's Ozzy, not Jimmy, but I do have a Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, well, you mean Ozzy's one of the greatest people in the world? Or Jimmy? Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy. yeah, that's what I, I love. I love, I love Jimmy. But, but, but it's funny how this whole thing works because then you left and they got Tony Franklin, who I played with. Well, Tony was playing with with uh, Roy Harper at the time, and so exactly he, he knew Tony, and he said, "I'm just going to get Roy's guy. He's got a kid playing with him. He's really good. He's going to come in and play." Yeah. And that's how Tony ended up there. 
Incidentally, the, the way the name, the, the firm, the name came up was, was rather funny. Um, we, uh, every day we went in for rehearsals, Jimmy would, Jimmy's guy would come in with a box and he'd open the box and in the box was cigarettes and was bottles of uh, tonic water and Jimmy would shuffle through them and he'd find the bottle of tonic water with a torn label and he'd say, this one has the gin in it. So he'd mix up a gin and tonic and then we'd have cig he'd have cigarettes and stuff. And anytime you wanted anything, he'd say, well, take something out of the box. You want a pack of fags, take, take a pack out of the box. And I'd say, well, is that all right? And he goes, no, it it's the firm's. Meaning to say it belongs to the company. Everything was the firm's. And eventually right. the name stuck, the firm. Right. That was right. it. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so your practices with, with Jimmy, I mean, how he seems to me um, so methodical. Uh, you, you know, your rehearsals, were they you think a little bit more extended than normal? I mean, he just seems to be such a perfectionist. Well, the first day we went to play, it was Chris, it was Chris Slade and myself and him. And we had no idea what he was going to want to do. Um, and no one had seen Jimmy in years. So he plugs in and there's all these guitars and he picks up a guitar and, and starts playing and starts trying to describe some kind of crossover beat. And he's doing this thing where he punches his fist in the air, which, which he does. If you watch him, he's trying to sort of play on the offbeat or whatever. And Chris and I were looking at each other and we were just going, oh shit, I hope this works out because we're just not getting this. And uh, all of a sudden, there's a, a remarkable moment. Jimmy stopped us and he said, look, he said, I know you guys are a little nervous about playing with me, but I'd like you, you have to understand, I haven't played in a few years and as nervous as you are, I'm probably 10 times more nervous. <laughs> wow. And it, That's it, a broke the ice. it broke the ice completely. And immediately we started playing like train kept a rolling and we started playing, uh, uh, you know, to communication breakdown and we started finding all these old rockabilly songs to play. And we just had the best time and we just picked for fun. We just played music and he was having a great time just playing music and so were we mm -hmm. and and rediscovering all the early influences it was it was a, a magical magical time so with, regardless of whether whether i was in the firm or not that that is probably my favorite part of my entire career i, I have to say uh, what about me yeah you come in a, a close second Vinny. but uh, <laughs> 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 Yeah. Hey, Kenny, um, let's talk about Dust for a minute and Marky and working with Marky and that whole, was, was that whole Ramones kind of crew or vibe part of Dust? It, you know, was it, was it hanging around Dust? Not no, at no, all. No, not at all. Oh, I mean, not at all. Lord, no. <laughs> it was the extreme, you know, uh, I was listening to some Dust the other day. And I just sat there going, who are these people playing? Because it's like, it's just me. It's a whole other lifetime, lifetimes away than from, from what I do as a bass player now. I mean, I could not do that anymore. I don't know how I did it then. And, uh, I, and <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark was incredible drummer at the time. He was like, Mitch Mitchell on steroids. I mean, he was Bonham. He was Mitch Mitchell. He was just, and I tried to play as many notes on the bass as he was playing on drums. I mean, that's <laughs> what we did, you know? And, and I listen to it now and I just, I, I lose my breath. I can't keep up with it. It's really in, intense. And, and, and it's, and it's great for what it is, but you know, it was like, Going on from that and then working as a sideman for all the different people I've played with over a period of long, such a long period of time is what made me a better, better musician. Each person, you know, whether it was Leslie yelling at me or, you know, <laughs> don't do this. or I don't want another Jack Bruce in the band or this person or that, you know, that's how you learned, you know, and then I just sort of, you know, Guess I became a pretty versatile side kind of guy, you know, which which I, you know, I'm glad because I've I've kept busy, you know, and I've played with so many great people and so many different genres and styles of, of rock and roll. And it's and I enjoy that because I get bored doing the same thing all the time anyway. I don't want to do that. I mean, I admire people that 
were hugely successful in, in a big act, you know, and made great money and hopefully they didn't kill themselves with it and they were wise with it. But I never had that, but I would never trade my my journey and all my musical experiences though with all the people I've played with. Yeah. So, you know, so Phil, who, was um, guitar, who was the guitar player in Dust? Right. In Dust was Richie Wise. Uh, <laughs> right. Richie Wise, <laughs> Richie Wise produced but you know the, what? the second Richie, King. Richie Wise produced the second KGB record. Yes. And, he, it, was, and so, it wasn't and it wasn't very so long Richie, after you were them. Rich Richie, you know what? Richie was always the kind of guy that loved his high school sweetheart. He married her, they're still married. I know that if Dust became somewhat successful or whatever beyond what we did, if we went on the road and really had, a, had the tour, Richie would have been miserable. He didn't want to do that. So when he and Kenny Kerner, yeah. when, they, when, they, when Dust broke up and they produced Brother Louie and then Neil set them up with Casablanca, and then they went and got Kiss. Then yep. they went on to Gladys Knight. He was he was happy, man. He was happy being in the studio. He was happy going home to his wife every night. He loved being in the studio surrounded with gear. That's what Richie was really happy doing, you know? Producing A and R stuff, you know, just that's that's yeah. really was where he was at. Yeah. Wasn't into being a Great. rock star. Hmm. Uh, Dust was what is, is a very underrated band. I tell you what, great, amazing. I'm surprised you don't have a Dust T-shirt. <laughs> you know what? I should have. I'm in Virginia somewhere. Time, it's in week. storage in New Jersey. <laughs> Usually, hey, uh, Phil, I want to ask you. You know, a lot of people. I don't know if a lot of people know of your uh, Phil, your uh, your involvement with the Grammys. You know, being a part of that. What made you get involved in that side of the business? Uh, well, originally, I, I was interested in getting involved because uh, when Randy Castillo first got ill with cancer, uh, he really uh, did not have very much resources. And to make a long story short, Music Cares really came forward for him. And it was the first I really got to know about what the Grammys did other than the, a show one night of the year. And uh, I decided I wanted to do something, you know, uh, because of that. I wanted to get involved with them and try to help out. And so um, one day I, 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 tried, I found out a lot about it and I wanted to, I was a member uh, and I wanted to get involved. I wanted to be on the board and uh, I was elected to the board and then I became head of, uh, chairman of the advocacy committee for the Grammys. So I traveled to DC and lobbied um, Congress for three years and um, on, on some of our rights, some of the issues which are important. And a couple of years later, I, was, I, was, uh, I became vice president of the, of the Los Angeles chapter. I held that for two no. terms and then termed out. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was good. Wow. Yep. Wow. A lot of people don't good. know. This guy's making a difference yeah. for musicians. Yeah, man, that's great. Well, that's great. It's, it's I, know pe I know people that are that trying to get uh, them to you know, help now with this uh, virus from Music yep. Cares. Yeah, you know? Music Cares is a really great foundation. It's a, it, it's, it makes life very easy, not just for musicians, but also for people who work in the industry. So for example, our techs, our roadies, our sound crews, you know, people who get sick and all of a sudden there's nobody there to help them out, you know? And so in that respect, in that regard, and, and Music Cares used to raise a fortune. They used to raise some 15, 18 million dollars a year of charitable contributions that would go directly to these people. So the Grammys does a lot of things, you know, and not just the show. Uh, but I wanted to do it as a sort of tribute to Randy and uh, and also because I was I became passionate about it And once I termed out I was like there was a point where I was I could have become president or a trustee And then I just said you know what I've done seven years and uh, I think I've done uh, I've done what I want to do here So yeah, good for you. Good. Nice Yeah, it was, it was I, uh, I never knew that yeah, cathartic. I think it's great. He gave back, you know, if you give him back yeah. That's yeah, a big right, deal without a doubt. Yeah Hey, Kenny, 1988, Rolling Stone magazine, basis of the year. How did <laughs> yeah, that, that all happen? 1988, 88. Yep, right? 1988. How yeah, did that, uh, how did that come to I'm having trouble hearing some of this dialogue. 
Okay. Yeah. So, again, so, again so, so, I, mm -hmm. I beat out Marcus Miller. Woo! <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, that was lucky. What uh, what what in 1988 that made it so special? You think? I have no idea how that. Sh you know what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they had a big I, I didn't even know about it. I had a, I think it was a cousin of mine called me up and said, "Hey, did you know you're in the Rolling Stones critics poll of bassist of the year?" I was like, "What? I had no idea." <laughs> Are you sure? No, that's crazy. I just found out, like from from a, a relative. Yeah. I'm really, really flattered. I would never say I deserve anything like that. There's so many great. I mean, for, to me, for me to, to to beat out Marcus Miller, I mean, <laughs> come on, jeez, that guy's like you know, he's a genius. You, you guys, both, you, you guys both have the hats. We both <laughs> have the hats. <laughs> both have the hats. Uh, hey. <laughs> Now, Phil and Vinny, you got a several ways where you guys are kind of, you know, cross the uh, crossing paths. How did you first meet? And, uh, you know, how did the whole your journey together was well, less of mine and as you know, how this whole thing, how did your relationship happen? I, I, met, I first met Vinny through uh, through Jimmy Bain. Uh, I think years and years and years ago. Long ago. Oh, was it was it through Jimmy? It was. It probably was because I joined Ozzy and I was, yeah. I was friendly with Jimmy at the time. And I think that's how that's how we met. Um, I'm not sure exactly when, but uh, you know there was a there was always a very great uh, uh, close underst uh, understanding and feeling between the members of these two sister bands between Ozzy and Dio. You know, I don't know what ever went down between Ronnie and between Ozzy, but as far as the players went, we had a lot of respect for each other. You know, yeah, right. So drummers had respect for the drummers, and bass players had respect for the bass players, and so on and so forth, and so. Um, of course, it was like uh, we were we were almost like a, a related band in a way, and Jimmy yeah. was uh, was a, a dear friend at the time, and he was just a just a wonderful a wonderful soul and a great human being. Aww. Yeah, you, you remember? Know. Yeah, he was great. He was great when I first when I first got to know him. Right, right about when the time um, the first Dio album came out, and he kind of really I think he polished up his act and stuff, and he was just in a great headspace. He was really cool. And um, you remember after that, we bought the house in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, Jimmy, in Woodland Jimmy, Hills. Jimmy Bain bought this house in Woodland Hills. It's a really <laughs> nice house. It came fur furnished. Actually, my wife was the uh, real estate agent. It came furnished. He moved in with a suitcase or two. And that night, there was a party. Yeah, and it looked oh. like it looked like the early Hilton decor with the velvet. <laughs> and shit. And all this gaudy, gaudy uh, furniture, and uh, that was like the party house, you know. You yeah, moved in. That was it. Yeah, yeah. been there. Remember that one? It yeah. it almost it almost looked like it was a it was a house that belonged to somebody in the mafia, but not somebody really high ranking. <laughs> <laughs> Just a hitman. Just a little yeah. hitman. Right. Yeah, it's like the movie Casino. You know, it's a little bit kind of had that vibe about it. Remember? Yeah, mm. yeah, and then when he sold it, she had to go there when they had open houses. She had to go there on Sunday. Kenny, it's Justine that sold it. Uh, <laughs> real uh, yeah, you have to go there early Sunday, clean up the ashtrays and the bottles, and it was just a wreck. You know, yeah. on a Sunday after the weekend and shit. I remember so, Justine uh, and her mother. Yeah, Lena. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, so that house was unbelievable. Then they yeah. finally sold it, you know. You know, I'll, t I'll tell you something because all the time Jimmy lived in there, do you remember he never changed the carpet? It had like a five inch shag pile carpet. <laughs> in fact, I think when, when he left, they were still finding people buried in there who had come to the parties that had never got out of the house. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it's so funny. It was a trip. Maybe that's where Hoffa is. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> No, uh, there they are. Wow, well, Ricky Benali, right? And there's Tony. Tony, yeah. Tony, yeah, that's that, uh, nice. rock and roll fantasy camp. There's a lot, a lot of history in that picture right there. Oh yeah, yeah. that's Frankie Benali, where right, right? Yeah, yeah, Frankie, God bless him. Yeah. Man. Yeah. God bless him, man. He's fighting real hard right now, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Woo. yeah. The, the the righteous brothers. Hey Vinny, who's that young guy next to you? <laughs> I know, right? Who's that kid? Is that your intern? 
Uh oh, look out. Look at him. Oh my gosh. That's not Phil. That's, that's me. That's not me. No, no, that's yeah. not me. That's Tara. That's Tara. There you go. There they are. Yeah. There hey, Kenny. Um, uh, you've been talking, you know, again, me at the Arcada Theater, just like you guys were, were feeling the, the pain of this whole situation. You know, we had Vanilla Fudge date uh, scheduled. We had Last in Line date scheduled. We had Cactus date scheduled. And we had Yardbirds date scheduled. Yeah, what uh, happened? Brian, Jimmy, Hardy, and you over. We're dying I over here. I was so looking forward to that. You have no idea. And yeah. everything oh, just very good idea, actually. Everything just blown out of the water now. Yeah. You know? I know. It's, How did the whole yard birds thing come about with Jimmy McCarty and um, you know whoever you were you were dealing with at that time? So um, I was uh, just home doing my normal stuff that I do with whoever I do it with, <laughs> and uh, a guitar player buddy of mine in New York, John Paris. He's a blues guitar player. He used to play with uh, Johnny Winter. Um, we email each other just about musical stuff. One day he sends me an email about something, sends me an MP3 of something, and he goes, by the way, I think the Yardbirds are looking for a new bass player. You should get in touch with Jim McCarty. He's on Facebook. So I said, jeez, okay. So I, I just found him on Facebook. I wrote him a, a short note. I told him who I was. I said, I won't bore you with the info, with, you know, with the history. Just Google my name. You'll see who I am. I said, I've been a huge Yardbirds fan since I was 12, 13 years old. I said, if you're looking for somebody, I'm available. And two days later, he got back to me and he said, you got the job. Wow. That was it. We did a bunch of shows together. With yeah, Fudge that's a great yeah. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, we did that cruise. That was great. Yep. Yeah. You don't want to do a cruise now. <laughs> no, man. Yeah, it's yeah, a right. floating, floating yeah. Petri dish. Yeah. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> do you know like any of the, the, uh, oh, the original Yardbirds? Do you know if the, any of the original Yardbirds know uh, – uh, after any of those guys ever getting, you know, uh, uh, come to a show or speak to, uh, to, to to Jimmy McCarty or any, you know, any of that stuff? Are they involved? Yeah, no, I mean, Jimmy, they're not involved. But Jimmy, Jimmy, and Chris Dreha actually are, you know, are part ownership of the Yardbirds. Still, they have they're they're involved with the business of the band. Wow. As, it, as any variation of the band uh, since. Chris left because I guess he had a few strokes and he just couldn't play or travel anymore. I met him a year or two years ago. He was great. I mean, he seemed fine and it was very nice to meet him. Uh, but so they, they run the business basically, you know, it's their business. And uh, I know mm -hmm. that I think, I think Jimmy, I think Jim McCarty still is in touch with Paul Samuel Smith, the original bass player. And I think Jimmy, mm -hmm. uh, Jim is still uh, friendly with Paige. Yeah, I know. I know they're friendly with Paige because I know they were in touch for a, a not, you know, a couple of maybe two years ago, a year and a half ago over something. I forget now. And then, uh, and Henry Smith, who was our tour manager for a while up until last year. Uh, I think he was instrumental in getting Jimmy that Black Les Paul back to him that was stolen years ago. Oh, right. Right. It's a great story. So, yeah. So, and, and Henry was, was, was involved with that. So, yeah. Jim it's McCarty is a really, really great guy. Really sweet, sweetheart. Really I'm, is. We love I'm, him. I'm amazed. I'm amazed today at how everything's crisscrossing. Yeah. yeah, with each other. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. I think more of this, more of this show than any other show that we've done. Well, yeah. if, if this group of people right here yeah. just did a family music tree, yeah, yeah. it would be pretty <laughs> I mean, wild. It would just be, it would be, be great. It would be incredible. It'd just be, be a incredible. straight line. Everyone's connected to each other. Oh, you know, yeah. it's like it's, 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 it's a separation thing. Look how it goes from you. Through Jimmy Page and you know to Phil to the oh, Phil. I mean, it's really awesome. when I was young when I was a kid. I, Carmine was a he, Carmine and Timmy Bogart were 
heroes of mine. Jimmy uh, Bogart, I used to see him play. He was an animal. Yeah. The guy was an animal. He yeah. was. Lead bass and distortion. And I mean, but he was an American. You know, he wasn't like, wasn't British. He was doing this. He, was, he wasn't Jack Bruce. <laughs> you, and, and, <laughs> but, but the thing was, the thing about that I loved about Timmy was he was really influenced by James Jamerson. Yeah. Yes. But he, yeah. he, he just channeled that. It was steroids. I mean, just yeah. explosive, <laughs> like yeah. just incredible. I mean, I remember seeing Cactus and, and, and oh God, I mean, Cactus. I have seen Cactus. Oh, it was amazing. These guys, the adrenaline in that band was yeah. truly scary. It was scary. scary. I see oh, some video. Cool. I see videos of Cactus at, at the Isle of Wight Festival uh, that somebody has, and maybe it'll come out someday. The adrenaline was unbelievable. unbelievable. I mean, my playing, the sticks were up, way up here, and when I come down on the cymbals, it was a whole body. It wasn't just you know hitting the cymbals. It was like destroying the cymbals. You know, like I mean, Vinnie was, like Ronnie called Vinnie the wrecking machine. I was a wrecking machine when Vinnie was like eight years old. <laughs> and and, and, and that, that's machine. what I aspired to be. You know, that's what I wanted to be, like you guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did a tour together with, I subbed for Bobby Rondinelli with a band called The Lizards and The Fudge. Right. And across Europe. And Timmy was playing. And I saw him do solos each night, just Timmy. And I haven't seen anything like that. It was incredible. Yeah. The, the solo was so interesting. You know, melodic. Jimmy, Jimmy was really oh, way yeah. ahead of his time back Jimmy, yeah. back back then. I mean, yeah. it was. You know, and then when I saw oh, B, yeah. when I saw BBA, you know, and Tim, you know, right up there playing with Jeff. Yeah. You know, yeah. no no intimidation there that I that I could sense. No. I mean, I no, actually, this, I, we, I we have a live, we have a live that. album, we have a live album that I mixed two years ago, that probably will come out once we get Jeff. Uh, you know, like Jimmy said, well, I'm not ready to be another year and a half. You know, that's what it's like. <laughs> you know, and uh, when I talked to Jeff on the phone after we mixed it, he said, not only is it a great record and great playing, but the the playing is humorous. He said. And I, I got to admit, it is because like Jeff will do something sick and then Tim will do something sick, which will inspire me to do something sick. And it goes around the thing, but the, within the groove, it was pretty amazing. This was 1974, our last gig, Phil, you know, the place, the London Rainbow. Oh my God, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we did two shows there, yeah. that was our last show. And eventually, hopefully this will come out because there's some unbelievable playing on all the three of our parts. Yeah, and I did, most, I did most of the singing on that yeah. album too, yeah. which is pretty wild. That's and I'm playing and singing, and I'm going, oh my God. You know, <laughs> I listen, how am I playing and singing that stuff? You know, really crazy. Well, I can't wait to hear that record. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I got, actually, I, I have a copy. I, I could actually send you guys a copy. If you That'd be great. Right I'd love yeah. that. I'll do that. I think you gotta put together a show. Send us a copy. We'll put it up on the website. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll put it on YouTube. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll put it all on YouTube. And that'll be the end of the deal. Right. Without a doubt. Anyway, right. good stuff. It's great stuff. So, so are you guys planning? I mean, we should oh, go ahead, Vin. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say I had a, a today I went and got a colonoscopy. Today. Oh, nice! <laughs> so I'm fucking laying there they, with the IV and everything, and I'm just laying there in, the, in the bed for an hour and a half. I go, what's going on? I was almost going to take it out and go, you know what? I'll come back uh, later or something. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you were used to it by now because this is what your fifth or sixth one this this month. They're all ignoring me. All the fucking nurses and shit. Yeah, they're walking by. Say, hey, what's the hold up here? Oh, it's it's just, you know whatever. It's just going along. Don't worry about. It. So, okay. So then I go in with the doctor, and he goes and he asks me what do I do for a living, and I tell him. Oh shit, really? And he looks me up, and 
next thing I know, I'm out. I'm unconscious with that stuff. It's insane. And yeah. I wake up, and the nurses are there with masks. I go, what's up? They go, can you sign the masks? So I, <laughs> oh, wow. I signed three masks and a shield. <laughs> right. so what? are you kidding and then i took pictures with him and stuff I, oh now you like me right so i'm a little groggy still yeah, yeah. We, yeah we, were saying, you were under, we were saying earlier you know, that, I, I thought yeah. I saw the, but you know what they found some old derringer tapes in there from the <laughs> 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 me being so <laughs> I thought I saw your. Uh, I thought I saw your probe on. Yeah, it's it's set, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so clean. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, hopefully, it still works. That's funny. I went to a cardiologist today, and uh, Mark Stein from the Fudge gave me this guy's, you know, number down here. So I went, had a, a little checkup, and and said, "Funny, I just got this in the mail today. You know, I collect vinyls." He puts up on his phone. He just received a, a bid to buy a Vanilla Fudge album. Yeah. I, I said, what a coincidence, you know. Wow. Were you selling it? He, no, well, somebody was selling it for him. Hey, hey, Carmine. Yes. Guess what I did today? What'd you do? Went to my cardiologist. <laughs> you did? did you, you did too? Uh, yeah. I, oh, I, I, had a, I had a nuclear stress test done today. Oh, those are fun. Yeah. yeah. I, thought, I thought you had a nuclear stress test with dust <laughs> when you play with well. dust. <laughs> that, that was a nuclear stress test. Yeah. Oh my hey, now, god! Now, now we're showing our age. Right? Yeah, we really are. It's <laughs> embarrassing. This is the conversation for like legendary rock and rollers. I think people are expecting here. Yeah. They'd rather hear about LSD trips well, than well, cardiology. Well, Phil and I, Phil and I, can probably give you some good Billy Idol stories. Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Give, me one. give me one good one. The only difference, the only difference, the only difference is that to, that everybody's still getting medication. The only difference is today it's with a prescription. That's all. Yeah. How do I know? Right. <laughs> yeah, it used, to be in, it, 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 used, it, it used to be in the old days. We'd go, hey, man, were you with that chick? Were you, were you with that blonde chick last night? Yeah. Did you do some quaaludes? Or, yeah. And now it's like, hey, what, what uh, cholesterol pill are you on? <laughs> are you, are you on a blood pressure pill? You know? Hey, Ron, Are you talking hey, Ron, about of pills these days? You need to change the name of this show to uh, like medical stories from all the <laughs> Rock and roll medical stories oh, yeah. man. on lockdown. <laughs> on lockdown. You know, you guys, um, give, Kenny, you got to give me just one quickie about Billy. About Billy one Idol? I know you uh, got it. Billy, you, you want to hear a good Billy Idol story? Yeah. Yeah. Hey. yeah. So every night in the dressing room after the show, he'd have to have his leather pants taken off for him by the wardrobe girl. <laughs> we're, we're friends on Facebook, so I will not mention her name. Very sweet girl. And she'd have to kneel down in front of Billy and pull off his leather pants. <laughs> of course, there's no underwear involved. Oh, and of course, the sweat would stain him, you know, with like the shit from the leather. It gets all over his skin. And he'd sit there and he'd go, oh, Blue Balls is back. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that's, it. That's, that's, a, a that's, a, that's a polite one. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, oh, Billy, guys, I, I got one for you, but this is a, this is an extracurricular story. One of the things that we did, one of the first things we did when, when Billy moved to L.A. is he went and bought a Harley. So I've been riding bikes since I was 14 years old or whatever. And uh, so we had Harleys and there was not too many people riding around with Harleys. And one day we were leaving the club and uh, I don't know what was going on. We were talking and uh, uh, outside and all of a sudden we hear this noise and this Harley goes tearing off up the street and we're like, oh fuck, it's Billy. And we're all, I don't know, back in, I don't want to incriminate anybody, but we were probably drinking or whatever and we were probably trying to figure out how, how we can get home as quietly and as, as, uh, as, as, uh, as uh, peacefully as possible. So he tears off up uh, Wilshire and so we jump on our bikes and we tear off after him 
and then we see it's made right up Fairfax and he's torn up and this light is just getting smaller and smaller and this is a, so he's really gunning it finally we see something in the middle of the street it's a light and it's getting bigger so we're getting closer to it and it's a junction of Fairfax and Melrose and right in the middle of the junction is Billy with his bike and he's in that point of no return which is when you take a 750 pound motorcycle and you're about to lay it down on the ground and you've just got enough strength to stop it touching the ground but not enough strength to lift it up and he was stuck there and the, but his hand was stuck on the throttle so it was like <laughs> so we pull up we jump off we jump off we kick, kill the engine we help him pick up the bike we're like you okay he looks around he says yeah do you think anyone noticed <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> so that wasn't when he broke his leg. That wasn't when he broke his leg. No, no, no. That was when he, he he caused considerably more damage to his ego than to any motorcycle. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> wow. you guys, hey, hey, Kenny, I gotta. Phil, thank you so much for joining us on our artists on our medicated artists on lockdown uh, episode uh, this week. Yes. Um, thank you. For I, I, me. Thank you. I got to say something. I got to say, you know, Carmine. I've known Carmine. We've known each other a long time. Yeah. Carmine and Vinny, I have so much respect for these two guys. It's unbelievable. Yep. They're the great drummers, and it's every day that I get to play with Vinny. It's just like. Uh, it's an adventure. It's an honor. And, Thanks, uh, Phil. And yeah, we, you, and but we do. We have a we have, we a, have a great time. time. We have yeah. a great time. We have a great time. We laugh around, and and the music is just tremendous. So this yeah. is really. Uh, I'm so pleased to be able to do this. And like I said, I'm a huge fan of Kenny's, of course. For, and for Phil, years. let's stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely, I would love yeah. to. Do that. And, yeah. and Phil, Phil did play a bunch of gigs with us with Drum Wars, which is yeah. pretty, pretty I, cool. Yeah. So. And well, I got why. to play you with two amazing bass players. I mean, Kenny yeah, and I, yeah, yeah. we killed it. Phil and I killing it now. And uh, yeah, I'm really lucky. So. And Kenny plays with me well, now with my Rod Experience show, which is a, uh, which is like a, a tribute to the Rod band. But we have people like that played with Rod in it. And oh, except, for, right. except for Kenny. Yeah. We used to have Phil Chen, but Phil didn't want to do it. So I, I called Kenny. I said, he'd be perfect for it. And we played your place, Ron. I know that. I know that. Yeah, and that's yeah. where I'm the luckiest one on this show today to be surrounded by icons and legends like Bill Susan, Kenny Aronson, Vinny Apice, and Carmine Apice. Guys, thank you so much for being a part of this. We wish you health, safety, you know, good health. We hit the arcade and on the road very, very soon. Uh, I want to thank Steve Love for putting this all together. Ben Wheeler, our producer. Everybody out there, please share, like, join us on Artists on Lockdown and, every week. And then next, brother, next, Pardon me? Next, next week, week, next week, Bumblefoot. Hey. Ron Bumble, Bell, Bumblefoot. Bumblefoot. Guitarist from Guns N' Roses and so many other things. Thank you very much, guys. Stay safe. Everybody out there, stay safe and out there. And we'll see you next time. Hey, guys. Time on Thank you, guys. Take Thank care. Guys, Thanks, everybody. Ron. Cheers. See you guys. Bye. 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 Bye.